focus of my talk today is less about my own business. I figure you guys probably don't need a sales pitch. Um, but I will give you a brief overview. So import, importgenius.com is a uh, website that we like to think of it as sort of democratizing the world of international trade. So for thousands of years, people have really jealously guarded their sources, where they buy products. What, if you're importing something from another country, you don't really want someone to know, like, where, do you, where did you buy that thing? Because that's your secret to how you make money. Um, so what we did at Import Genius was we discovered that in the United States, and actually, as it turns out, in several other countries, the shipping manifest for ocean freight imports is considered to be a public record. So that document, the shipping manifest, the bill of lading, you may have studied it in this class, is, uh, contains information about who bought the product, so who the importer is in the United States, who their supplier was overseas, what the product was, the weight, the number of units, right, all the date that it arrived, the ports that it went through, the addresses of both the parties, so like just tons of really good data. Uh, we collected, so far we've collected 60 million of those documents, uh, got them in digital format, and then made the whole thing searchable. Um, I'll, I'll provide your class with the login so you can test it out. But basically, if you're thinking about getting into import-export, and I'll give you an example, if you want to start like a clothing line. Well, there's some companies out there that have already spent millions of dollars doing research on who the best factories are, going visit them, making sure that their standards are up, you know, like their labor standards are good, that they have good environmental practices. Um, hey, welcome. Um, that they, you know, so for example, you, can, you, can, you guys can probably think of a good clothing brand that you like. And we can show you where they, where they buy their clothes, who their factories are that produce them. So if you're thinking about importing, it's much easier for you to go direct to the source doing that than it would be to go to a trade fair or to search online or do, you know, on the internet, the open internet. Um, so we have a subscription service that we sell access to. It's at importgenius.com, but I'll, for your class, I'll definitely give you guys some access so you can test it out. But actually, my talk is actually uh, more about the historical context. So I find it, I'm, a, I'm not a historian. Um, I should start by saying that, but I, I find it to be fascinating. Um, and I think that the history of our world is made up largely about the history of international trade. And I'm gonna to try to demonstrate that to you today. That the, way, the, the reason that we are the way we are is because of trade. Um, and I mean that in, a, in a, the, the most um, very real sense. So this right here is a clock. Um, why, why did I pick to start this talk with a picture of a clock? And international trade, what does the clock have to do with it? What, what, why, would it why would I care about it, the time? What's that? The time value of money is good, yeah. And there's time zones, right, which is annoying. You have to call people in the middle of the night if you want to do international trade. Um, but actually, no, this clock is a special clock. This is the very first marine clock, the first clock that worked at sea. Uh, it doesn't seem like much. Why would you want to know if you're, and this was made in the 1760s. Why would you want to know what time it is if you're in the middle of the ocean? Who cares? Well, as it turns out, until this clock was invented, there was no way to position yourself on the Earth to know where you were on east and west latitude. You could do north-south by looking at the stars, but you couldn't do east and west, which made it a very dangerous thing to go out to sea and not know where you are, right? Yeah, a very risky business. This clock revolutionized world trade because it was the first clock that could work under the conditions of, a, of sea, right? Well, imagine there's salt water, there's humidity, there's rocking back and forth, all these things. Uh, this clock, by, how, how, does it, how does it work? So what you do, you're in London, you set the clock at high noon. You wait till the sun is at the highest point in the sky, you set it to 12 o'clock. Now you get on your boat and you go sailing. And you sail, and now when you look up and it's high noon, you look at your clock and it says that it's 6 p.m. But Lon it says 6 p.m. On, on your clock, but it says that the sun is right up your, over your head. What does that tell you? You've gone one-fourth of the way around the world. So if you do that, you can do that and precisely pinpoint your location. Uh, you don't often think about the clock having anything to do with your location, right? But in fact, that's before GPS, that's how it was done. That's how it was discovered. So the world completely transformed with this, with this uh, invention of this clock. It made international trade much more feasible for, for everyone to do. Now, that was invented by this guy. His name is uh, John Harrison. But, and there, there he is holding it, right, in this painting. Um, but I will venture to you that John Harrison had no idea how to make that clock. That no human being 
knows how to make that clock. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna show that to you. I'm gonna illustrate that point with this, which is a picture of a, of a pencil. And the pencil, who, who thinks they know how to make a pencil? It's wood, some graphite, metal, and rubber. But if you remember, to make wood, what do you have to do? You have to know how to make saws. You have to know what mining. You have to know how to uh, hollow the wood, how to cut it, how to transport it. There is no human being alive that knows all the processes that go into uh, making something as simple as a pencil. And so in a very real sense, trade is what makes us human, right? It's like we have exceeded the capabilities of one individual because we're doing things every day that we just take for granted because we depend on this trade, on these linkages between different people. And, and the pencil is a great illustration of that. This, comes, this is not my idea, but this comes from a, um, a paper written in like the 50s uh, called Eye Pencil, which is a really interesting academic exercise where the guy tries to explore everything that goes into making a pencil and how it would be impossible for any human being to know all of these things. And his point is that the government should just get out of the way. Now, I'm not going to say that that's my point necessarily, but that by allowing people, just having faith that people will figure things out, there's no person coordinating. Like, the, to order the rubber, there's the guy who's making the, the pencil didn't call the people in Malaysia and say, hey, I need you to plant this many rubber trees and do this. And it's all worked out by market dynamics. It's all through the force of prices being exchanged on the open commodity that something like this just happens. It just emerges. This is a hand axe. This was not made by, well, it was made by humans, but this was not made by Homo sapiens. This is made by Homo erectus, which is our ancestor, the ape, a pr a primate ancestor. This uh, little device, which could be used for all kinds of, it's a tool, right? You can use it to chop nuts or whatever. I, I don't know exactly that much what they used it for, but these things were made for 1.5 million years without changing. They didn't, they didn't innovate. There was no addition of new uh, ideas. There was no common, oh, let's put a handle on it. Let's do this or that. Nothing. 30,000 generations made the exact same tool. Could you imagine that in a human society? No. I mean, in very real sense, the exchange of ideas that takes place through trade is what makes us human. Um, the, again, I, f I feel like it's important to sort of cite sources. A lot of times that gets lost, but uh, there's a great talk on, on TED.com. Uh, by Matt Ridley, which I recommend, where he sort of goes deeper into this idea of trade making us human. But I think it's a good place to start out is to put it in context and say, how important is international trade? Well, in a very real way, it, it is what made us who we are. And so let's talk about the mechanics of it, right? Um, a horse can carry about 200 pounds, 30, uh, sorry, mostly metric system here, about 100 kilos. <laughs> Um, 30 miles in a day for a horse. I, I, that's the estimate that I read. So that's a pretty big breakthrough as far as technology. Now you could actually transport lots of stuff long distances, trading between societies instead of just exchanging an axe for a fish or something, right? Now you're talking about you could make a career out of transporting goods. Um, so that was a very important innovation. The next one, well, of course, is the wheel, which allows that same horse to pull about 4,000 pounds, 2,000 kilos, let's say. So that's a 20-fold increase in efficiency. But the real genius, the guy who I would like to meet, is the one who invented the first boat. You know, like the boat, it's sad that we don't know his name, right? The guy who invented the boat. But it, a boat can hold 60,000 pounds. Can put, with, a, with a horse pulling on a canal, can pull 60,000. Instead of the 200 that he carries on his back, if he's pulling it in a boat, 60,000. Now that's not important necessarily because canals were, take a lot of energy to build the canal, but it gives you a sense of the efficiencies that you get from a boat. That one horse can pull 200 pounds if it's on his back, 4,000 if it's in a wheels, and 60,000 in a boat. And uh, 60,000 pounds is about what an ancient sailing vessel could, could tow as well, you know, just from power of the sail. And uh, this, is a, this is like a um, recreation of an old Welsh boat that I found. So this is like a prehistoric boat. This is made of leather skin. You can picture what the first boats would look like. It's like basically taking some kind of wood and putting leather on it, a cow or animal skins, and create this, create a boat. And what I, would, what I read, um, 
the ancient Greeks recorded this, is that they would take uh, wine from Armenia and go down the Tigris River, right, through, so through modern-day Iraq. And they'd load up these boats with wine caskets and, and then s go down river. Now, you couldn't go back up river because the, the water's flowing too fast and they didn't have, so what they would do is load it up, put donkeys on the boat, go all the way down, and then take the skins off. Get rid of the wood, because wood's easy to replace, but the skins were harder to find. And put it on the donkeys and then go all the way back up and do it again each year. And every year they got a little bit richer, right? And it's compounding. Every year you make your boat bigger, you get compounding, and empires were built this way, ancient empires were mostly, even modern empires, almost all built on trade, which is, I think is uh, gonna be one of my theses today. Um, so what kind of stuff were they trading? Um, this, this is a picture of the Pope, he's burning incense. Uh, incense was one of the very early commodities in the ancient world. The Romans were totally addicted to incense. Uh, they burned it at religious ceremonies, both you know, pre-Christian and as part of Christian ceremonies. They also burned it you know, just as a luxury item. If someone can smell incense coming from your house, they know that you're rich because you could afford to buy this stuff that was transported long distance. So I have here, this is like a map of where the incense came from in the ancient world. And uh, I don't know if it's clear enough for you guys, but I mean, basically we're looking at Arabia, right? And these, these are the incense growing regions. And so they would come up on these camel caravans up and trade into the Middle East. The Romans traded extensively. The Romans and the Greeks in the Mediterranean world was extensively connected to the Indian Ocean. We forget about this uh, because the connection was lost at, at a certain point, or it was, I should, it was never lost, but it was uh, made more difficult. And what we have here are the trade winds. So you can see that the Indian Ocean has great winds where in every July it goes this way and every winter it goes that way, every January. You can just sail up and then wait till it come, turns around and then go back. Made it really easy. So lots and lots of commerce. And the Romans were deeply connected they had trade routes throughout this region, and there's really interesting documentation about what was traded where, and they talk about, they have documents that the Romans did of, of how it got too, far, too cold if you went up the Pacific coast. It, was too, it got frozen cold, and you couldn't go up that way. Well, the Romans were, I mean, they had traders going all around that part of the world, um, and trading all sorts, all sorts of commodities. Um, what happened? What, what happened that uh, suddenly the Romans were cut off from that? from that part of the world. In around uh, 620, 622 to 632 is when uh, Muhammad rises uh, in the Middle East. And I, I, don't, I mean this Iron Curtain of Islam is sort of just like a, a reference to the Iron Curtain, of course, of the Soviet Union. I don't mean to cast it in the same sense that the United States likes to cast uh, the USSR as this sort of evil empire. That's not what I mean at all. Um, in fact, the, the the Muslims were better traders perhaps than anyone. Muhammad himself was a merchant, was a trader. He's, of all the major world religions, the only one founded by a trader is uh, Islam. And they expanded throughout this entire region and suddenly the source of spices and incense and silks and all these wonders from the East became mysterious to the West, to those in Europe. Suddenly in Europe, all you knew was that if you wanted these things, you sailed to here, and you traded in Alexandria, and you traded with Muslims. But the Muslims would not allow, uh, infidels would not allow Europeans to enter into their, any deeper than just the port. You could go to the warehouse, you could trade, but you couldn't go inland. You couldn't go and find that source of those goods yourself. Um, which is actually relatively common. You'll see that in China as well. In China, uh, in the city of Guangzhou, which I was talking about before we started, uh, there's an island there which was the Portuguese island. So when the Portuguese arrived in China, eventually, they had this little island. The foreigners could come into town to trade. We wanted to be able to trade with the foreigners, but you couldn't go anywhere past that little island. Um, so that's a fairly common phenomenon. And so at that time, the Indian Ocean, by no means did the trade in the Indian Ocean stop. If anything, it accelerated. The Muslims were phenomenal traders and they traded throughout. And the reach of Islam today is largely defined by where its merchants went uh, thousands of years ago. The, you know, reaching as far out as the Spice Islands and Madagascar, and there's, there's uh, Muslim trade routes were, went throughout the Indian Ocean. It was in, in, in largely in, uh, a Muslim sea, a Muslim lake. 
And there's one point here, the Spice Island. So I want you to pay attention to how far in we have to zoom to find these little islands. There's little tiny islands, like way over there, right? In the corner of the world. These are the Spice Islands. They're nothing now. I mean, they're, they're just like, tourists don't even go there. I don't think they have good beaches and people don't pay attention to them. However, uh, most of the world's important spices originated here, geographically. Uh, they didn't exist anywhere else. So cinnamon, cardamom, mace, nutmeg, maybe not pepper, but you know, you could run down the list of like all the spices that you see in your mom's kitchen and like over half of them came from this chain of islands. And they couldn't be got anywhere else, right? How mysterious is that? There's this one place in the world, no one knows, only very few people know where it is, well-guarded secret. And the, very, the most expensive things in the world just grow there naturally. And so the, this became the holy grail of European exploration, to discover where are these places? Where are these spices coming from? And they were so valuable, in fact, that um, interestingly, this, this one here called Run was uh, traded for the island of Manhattan. It was a British colony and the Dutch, you know, Manhattan used to be a Dutch colony. And the Dutch actually won that war, but they gave up Manhattan. And they, the trade was that island for Manhattan. That's how rich it was, right? They didn't, oh, who cares about Manhattan? We want that, we want the Spice Island. And I'm sure they would like to take that trade back. So yeah, the, um, this is just a picture of a spice market, so you get an idea. These are the types of products that were coming from those islands. Um, who got rich off of the spices in Europe? That's where the, all the money to build Venice. Venice was built on the spice trade. And the, their, the Genoese merchants, because they could go, they were the ones that had these trading relationships with the Muslims, with the Middle East, and would go down and buy all the spices, and you would make 5x profit if you could make it safely home. If you could get from Venice to Alexandria, just a little journey across the Mediterranean, you get home, you make 5X. Pretty cool, right? Uh, they built an empire. I mean, they built, at that time, it was something of an empire. It was one of the more powerful states in Europe built on the backs of that spice trade. Um, I have not been there, so I don't know, but I, I, I assume that it, it's, you can see the wealth when you walk around the place. Yeah, you can see they used to be rich and powerful, right? And it's interesting that the price, I don't know this, I, I wish I had looked it up uh, properly, but I, I believe that the price, the price that you could buy spices on the Spice Islands, in silver, let's say, or whatever the, you know, the commodity was that you were trading it for, it's about a thousand times more by the time you get to Venice. Because throughout that Indian Ocean journey, you are, each guy is maybe going for two or three weeks and then selling it, two or three weeks selling it, two or three weeks selling it. Every time the price goes up, all the way across. And so the price, it was inflated astronomically. And we're, we're, we're lucky now, right? We can buy stuff all over the world and bring it home, and the price doesn't go up every 100 miles that you travel. What happens to change the dynamic? The Mongols, the Muslim Iron Curtain fell, it lifted for about 100 years, in 1250 AD. Who, what, what stands out about, uh, who's the most famous guy from Venice of all time? The most famous Venetian. You can probably only name one guy from Venice. Marco, Marco Polo. What, what did Marco Polo do? He pierced the Iron Curtain. He went through the Muslim Empire and made it to China. And what made that possible was that the Mongols defeated the, 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 the Muslims. The caliphate in Baghdad in 1258, these guys came in and leveled it, like in a way that makes like Hitler look like a nice guy. Like they killed every man, woman, child, over a million people in the city of Baghdad. It took hundreds of years for Baghdad to, to even become a city like that would be uh, anything close to what it was before that. And it never returned to the world stage. The Mongols are underappreciated in history. They're often just cast, like I just said, as barbarians, savage, murderer, killers, with no culture and no, uh, and, and no value to humanity. Um, they are underappreciated, although those things are true, they're underappreciated um, for what they did in opening Europe's mind to the East. Marco Polo and hundreds of other, Marco Polo is one who wrote it down, but hundreds of others journeyed to the East for the first time 
rediscovered these lands. Marco Polo famously returned home, right, with his inside of his clothes were completely lined with rubies. He served the great Khan for like 20 years, got his payment in, and came home complete and with just full of stories about the wealth of Asia and, and reignited in Europeans' minds all that was out there and all the money that could be made if we could just find the sources of these products, find the way to get back to Asia and trade with the, with the Asians. Um, so Marco Polo is, uh, like I said, a, a very important figure, largely for what he did in, in the mindset of Europeans. This, are, this is where he went. He traveled throughout. We think of him going to China, but he was also all throughout in, uh, India. And when he went home, he didn't want to go home overland. Most of the trade, with the, we think of the Silk Route, it mostly went by sea. The land route was very dangerous and difficult and much easier to float. Like we said, the efficiency of a boat is so much more than on land. So he wanted to go home the safe way by boat. And so that brings me, like I said, Marco Polo it, and brings the European consciousness, brings Asia back into the European consciousness. And where does that send, send us the next thing? This is the Strait of Gibraltar, the far end of Europe. And at the same time, uh, or this is 1415, Prince Henry the Navigator. The dates don't matter, but it's interesting. The, the, Prince Henry the Navigator took over this little town of Ceuta and, and uh, invaded Muslim North Africa, conquered this town, and discovered it too was completely full of gold and, and riches and, and gems. And it was this little border outpost at the end of the Muslim empire that who, it wasn't even an important city to them. And it was just so loaded with, with wealth, right? And it, again, the European imagination started to say, well, we, where does this stuff come from? It doesn't come from the south because you have the Sahara Desert. It must come from the east. And interesting, I discovered this yesterday when I was making this slide. Ceuta is still part of Spain. Did you guys know that? That's Spain, that's not Morocco. So it's been held by Europeans for, for ever since, basically. Um, and mean, meanwhile, the British hold Gibraltar, right? So the, the, the control of the strait is very, very important. Um, so what does Prince Henry do? Prince Henry decides to create this sort of modern day Silicon Valley or ancient day Silicon Valley. He gets all the techies of the world together in a little town in Portugal. All the guys who know how to make maps and instruments, sailors, people who, can, uh, people who have experience sailing, ship design, they brought hundreds of people together. And at around the same time, the, Sp the Spanish were persecuting the Jews. And so uh, lots of these very well-educated people were Jewish, and, and the Portuguese Prince Henry welcomed them with the skills that they had and created uh, this school of navigation, Prince Henry's school of navigation. I don't know what it was called. Um, and within, and they started working on new technology. So this, was a, this is a, um, a sextant, I believe, or a quadrant. I forget which one it was. Uh, sextant. And this is something for you sighting yourself, right, for your location with the stars. So you pointed at a star in the horizon, and now you know how far north or south you are on the Earth. So that was the kind of thing that they started developing, and they developed better ships, all with this notion that they're going to sail around Africa. If we're going to try to reach Asia, we're going to try to go around the Muslims, around that Iron Curtain, since we can't go through. And so this is the caravel, another piece of technology that sort of dramatically, it was very good for long distance sailing, and it could sail into the wind at angles that no one else could. So, um, the, the, the Portuguese start developing this stuff at the same time, right? The Chinese, you guys know about Zheng, Zheng He? Yeah. You, you must learn about him. Uh, yes, Ming Dynasty China. So this is the successors to the Mongols. The Mongols lasted 100 years. These are the next guys to come up and they commission this treasure fleet and they start exploring in the Indian Ocean. And look how far they went. You know, we think of the Europeans as the discoverers, but the, the Chinese sailed throughout the Indian Ocean. And their ships compare, here's the caravel that I just showed you that the Portuguese were developing. That's the Chinese treasure fleet and they would send hundreds of these out. They would send 30,000 men at sea. The big ship, right? Um, the, the Chinese only ran this program for about 30 years. And they, they managed to have all these different voyages and they were mostly, they were doing some trade, but they were actually more like diplomats, more like emissaries, explorers, discovering. And they weren't, it only lasted about 30 years. And then at some point, the Ming Dynasty 
a new, uh, an, an emperor died and the new one decided this is too expensive and they abandoned it. And people like to ask what, you know, what would be different if they had continued around Africa and made it to Europe. The ships certainly were capable of it. So the, the Portuguese start working their way down the coast. Same time, right? 1415, the Chinese are over here discovering this area, and the Portuguese are gradually working their way down the coast. And it took them about 100 years just to get to that little point right there. That little point was considered no man's land. If you went past, it seems like nothing right now, right? Who cares about that point? At the time, that was like, if you go there, you're going to die. You're going to go off the end of the earth and never come back. Crazy to think. There's like this nothing little spot on the map. But for, at that time in their mindset, it was like, you're going to die if you go past that. Eventually, they made it past, and they started establishing bases. And they were trading. They were buying slaves and bringing them slaves back to Portugal. Um, they were trading for gold and all kinds of stuff as they went to support the, vo the voyages. Each voyage kind of had to pay for itself and prove, hey, this is a good idea. Like, let's keep investing in these voyages. And they, uh, you'll still see legacy of this. This is a port. Um, this is in Ghana. I've been to this place. This is the, uh, a slave castle in Ghana. Um, so they built the castles as a supply depot for the voyages that would come and also as a holding pen for slaves. So they're buying slaves and it would be uh, folly to talk about international trade without at least mentioning the trade in humans um, because it's been a part of international trade almost since the beginning. The first guy, it, about from the time that Henry the Navigator starts this program, it takes about 150 years. So he's long dead before they reach the, the coast of Africa. This is Vasco da Gama. He is underappreciated as well. We talk about Christopher Columbus as the great explorer who discovered the Americas. But da Gama's voyage was about 10 times longer than Columbus's, and at least as dangerous. It was just the fact that... Uh, Columbus discovered a whole new continent, whereas da Gama discovered a route to an ancient continent, a new route uh, that makes Columbus overshadow him in history. Brutal, brutal man. Uh, when he arrived, so he's the first guy to hit the Indian Ocean, the first European to, to reach the Indian Ocean. And the first thing that he does, one of the first things that he does is he takes the town of Goa and he just holds it for ransom. And he kills like a ship of 300 men, women, and children. Just, just absolutely brutal guy. Um, but his methods worked. Portugal conquered India, or at least established bases all throughout India. And this is the result of, that, of the fact that the Europeans were able to get over here, and they had these faster ships that were more powerful than anything that was going on in the Indian Ocean at the time. And, you know, long story short, the Europeans end up conquering the world. Obviously, I'm sim oh, grossly oversimplifying as is required to make this work. Uh, but, um, but we are all familiar with that. And so what happens from there in my nice linear telling of, of world trade? Um, you have the rise of the first corporations. Uh, the East India Company is the, wor the, wor the world's first modern corporation. And the East India Company was built, was designed by the British. And it was actually a government run by a company. Imagine if you lived in a country where the entire government's purpose was to make money off of your country. That's what the East India Company was. They ran India like a company. They, had, they enslaved the people and they ran it like, hey, you guys are here working for us, the entire country. They're probably the worst company in the history of the world, the East India Company. I mean, if, I, if you had to look at the standards of, you know, the stuff that went on under their, because they were a government. Companies aren't meant to be governments. That's not how it's supposed to work. But that's what they did. Eventually, the British realized, like, hey, we can't do this. And they took it back and made it a colony of the crown. But only after some serious embarrassment of this company, you know, making them look really bad in the world. Um, it's the same East India Company you guys might have be familiar with, although this is more of a US history thing, but this is the Boston Tea Party. Same East India Company that they were protesting. The Tea Party, it's been so popular in American politics. The Tea Party is named after this incident, which is the anti-taxation uh, because the India, East India Company was taxing the American colonies. Same, same company, so we come full circle, right? And so in this telling, we start to, we start to approach the modern era, right? We're, we're getting closer. Um, the, the next big innovation, in my, to my view, 
that's going to sort of dramatically change the landscape of world trade, apart from European colonization, which I just went over in a huge, you know, multi-year course on its own, would be um, the advent of steam power. And that's in the mid-1800s. You start to get um, steam engines. Now, I think of steam engine, or at least I would have thought of steam, like once you invent steam and metal ships, you're done with wood, right? Why would you ever sail a boat again if you could use steam? Uh, it turns out it was actually a very slow process of converting from steam, from, uh, from sail power to steam power. And there's a simple reason for that. Coal, yeah, refueling, right? Like, how do you, once you run out, then you're stuck in the middle of the ocean. With a sail, there's none of that. Um, so this is, I think, an interesting graph that I found. Um, again, I should cite my sources. This all this comes from a book called uh, *The Splendid Exchange*, a great book on the history of foreign trade. Um, so look, you're, this is 1890. It takes a long time for steam, 40 years, right? Where steam is better. At, this is the distance. Traveled. So if you're under 2,000 miles right away, steam is better. But that you have to wait for efficiencies in technology before 1890 is when you start to get 10,000 miles. There's not many sea voyages in the world more than 10,000 miles. Probably 1900, you, you don't really use sailing ships anymore. And, and, and steam power is not just important for the motor, but also the hulls of the ship right, start to be made of steel. And now you can travel across the 10,000 miles, you can now cross the whole planet without refueling, without stopping to haggle, without stopping to trade. You know, you just take your goods and you basically take it from this port and you go across the world. Now you could do that with ships before that, but it was quite hazardous. Um, the next big innovation, I might skip some things over here. Certainly the discover of, discovery of oil and diesel powered ships is a, a very important um, innovation. But I think that, you know, this brings us all the way to the modern era with containerization. The containerization actually is a really good case in point uh, on world trade in general of the importance of standards, of having a standard size container that everyone in the world can agree on and getting people together at a table and say, hey, look, this is how big we're going to make containers so that they can fit inside of ships, so that they can fit on trucks and they can fit on trains. And now you can just pick it up and drop it. You don't need people to carry stuff on and off the boat. The, the size of a container ship today, it cannot be any wider than the width of the Panama Canal. And they're within, they're within that much. They, they've built these things to just be exactly the size of the Panama Canal. And uh, the Panama Canal is now being expanded and will allow for even bigger container ships. Interestingly, if you guys were in California, next time you guys go up to the Bay Area, you'll notice in uh, San Francisco, there's no, there's no cranes. They're all in Oakland. The port has moved to Oakland. Well, that, that, that was a result of containerization. That San Francisco was the port, and the unions refused to uh, go along with containerization. They refused because, hey, we don't need, there's no more need for our work carrying the stuff on and off the ships. And the area said, OK, forget you. We'll just build it in Oakland. And San Francisco lost its industry of shipping. So that's what the World Trade Organization was created for, right? It's, if people hate it and talk about it, they don't know anything about it. The World Trade Organization was created to allow these countries to come together and say, hey, let's set standards so that we can get business done. Um, classic example of that is the, um, the HTS. Have you studied the Harmonized Tariff Code? So every good in the world is classified according to a certain exact number, and only one and only one number. Uh, and it's all done in this document created by the World Trade Organization, the Harmonized Tariff Code. That, uh, to get people to agree. Now, why is that important? It's just paperwork, right? But if, every, if you imagine you're an exporter and you want to start selling your product in, in 50 countries, right? The world is our market. The internet allows us to go everywhere. Imagine if every one of those countries, you had to figure out what do they call this product and what do I have to pay in tariff and is it legal and all these other paperwork that go into it. So they created the harmonized tariff code so that every country in the world that, that's a member of World Trade Organization, which is like almost every country, uh, uses the same numbers to define the same product. So this product is the same in every country. Now all I have to do is go find that country's book, look up the, that code number, and now I know the tariff. I know how much I owe, I know if it's legal, I know what documents are required. 
great simplification, huge innovation from the World Trade Organization that you know, protesters in Seattle or wherever around the world don't appreciate. That the, the World Trade Organization is doing real and you know, real good for humanity by allowing, it, allowing us to connect and speak the same language across, uh, about products across the world. Um, so that brings us all the way to the next great innovation in international trade. You guys seen this image before? That's the internet. Um, this is actually old. It's probably way, like probably a thousand times more complex now. But each one of these tiny little, tiny little nodes, you'd have to get microscopic, uh, represents one uh, internet backbone, one element of the internet backbone. So like the actual physical infrastructure of the internet um, and how it's all wired together. And so like this might be like AOL with its walled garden or something, you know, like back in the day. Um, and I, I, I want to sort of bring my talk here because that's why I'm here, uh, the internet. Um, the internet is, we are so lucky to be you know, young and, and able to harness the internet at this era of international trade. So for thousands of years, I just went over how difficult it was, right, to get around the planet, to do business, to make things happen, how dangerous and, diff and, and just downright hard it was. And the internet has made it so easy in relative terms to, to do import-export. Um, and so this is where I guess I'll tell my story is that I started out um, with uh, my older brother and uh, another business partner of his and I was just working for them and they have a trading company that buys stuff in China and this was in uh, about um, 1999, 2000 and we were going to China and buying products and importing them, building websites and selling them uh, through the internet. In fact, we did it for the first four or five years without ever going to China. Literally did not go to China. Didn't know the people that we were buying from, were wiring money, just taking risks and making things happen and building websites and, and selling it on eBay and just like hustling, trying to find ways to make money on the internet. And um, that business grew and it's still, it's still a good business. I was um, never a partner in the business, I just worked for them. And uh, I went and lived in China for a couple of years um, in 2005, 2006, I lived in China as a buyer, basically, like going to trade shows, finding, um, finding suppliers, going to visit the factory, deciding like uh, if we should buy something. And then if we decided to buy it, taking pictures of it, making a website, creating a name, like a brand, and just like creating a company. Uh, that, things that you could never do before the internet. You know, like how would I, it, it would be impossible, even to meet the people, much less find customers. Right, so we were finding our suppliers and our customers on the internet. And our warehouse that we didn't own a warehouse, we just emailed some guy and he kept it in his warehouse. Trucking company, we did that on email. Like it was all internet, it still is. Um, so that's, that business grew up to be about, I think their peak in revenues is about six or seven million dollars. Um, so it, you know, a good sized business. Um, the margins are not what they could be. Uh, and you dealt with all sorts of problems with spare parts, uh, customer satisfaction, all kinds of problems that, that, that exist. Uh, but um, I would go to factories that I find on Alibaba.com. Are you familiar with that website? Alibaba is like a, a, a wholesale, it's like an eBay for wholesale, yeah. you know, to find wholesale product. Chinese people must know it, a very famous uh, Chinese company. And um, the problem with Alibaba was and is that uh, everybody on that site has paid to be on that site. So imagine you run a search in Google and every single result that you see is somebody paid for you to see that result. You probably wouldn't get the same level of like information you can trust. Um, and I found in a couple instances where I would go and actually make the time, fortunately I didn't fly all the way to China, I was living in China, but I would find a product that I wanted to import and I would say, oh, this looks like I could make money, good price, They're, you know, it seems like a cool product, it's what I want. I would go to the factory and it was a fake factory. Like they got like 10 of their friends together in some empty warehouse and pretended to make products for me, for like put on a show for me. There's, I mean, there's a lot of risk out there. And I would have never in a million years known that unless I went to that factory. You know what I mean? And they didn't even have a bathroom. That was my rule when I started visiting Chinese factories was to always use the bathroom. And then if they would be like, oh, always make sure I got to use the bathroom that the employees use because I would be able to see like, if you're not making a bathroom that an employee wants to use, like, you probably aren't making a good product for your customer either, you know what I mean? It was kind of my little rule that I invented. Um, 
which I, which I pass on to you. Uh, the, um, so yeah, after like a couple incidences like that where I just felt like so frustrated, like, man, I, I, you just can't trust the stuff that you see online, or how do I know what I can trust and what I can't trust? Um, we started diving in and seeing what kinds of data was out there about factories and about sh you know, what, what, what can we find. And we discovered that the shipping manifest is a public record, as I mentioned at the, at the start of my talk. Um, and so we, we took, uh, we're up to 60 million now. At the time, it was like 30 million records that we had to get into this uh, online format that we could search. And so it was a major process. It took like a year and a half to get it uh, from the idea stage to something that we could use, like a search a service that we could start to sell. Um, and in the beginning, we were using it for ourselves with our own, you know, we're buying stuff in China and figuring out like, hey, let's research their data that we, you know, let's collect the data about that company and then research them. Um, but always with the mind that like, hey, if this is good for us, it'll be good for anybody who's buying products in Asia. I came back home from China. I went to business school at, at um, Columbia Business School. And, um, and while I was in business school, I was working on this uh, Import Genius product. And we launched that. Um, I actually skipped my graduation day because I had a guy who was interested in buying the service and it was made my first sale on graduation day. And that was in um, 2008 was our first sale. And we, since then we've, we've, um, we've grown quite a bit. We've, uh, I should show you, there's our homepage. Um, we've, we've redone the, pay, the homepage a few times and updated the, the service a bunch of times and have lots of new products. Um, in the offing, but basically we're able to create this very, very successful business based around helping people do trade internationally and bringing more transparency to this market where we felt like it's too hard to know who's honest, who's not honest, what's, and we show you the real data, you know? What did the person actually ship? Who are their real customers? Um, and for you guys who are going back to China, we have lots of customers in China. In fact, we have a sales office in Shanghai and um, they, the Chinese factories are using it to find who in America wants to buy products like theirs, right? So we, we use it to research suppliers. Well, they're using it to research customers. And uh, freight companies are using it to see who's an importer who could buy my trucking service, things like that. As it is now, we sell subscriptions to this so you can access this data. You can see, you know, if you're trying to, um, thinking about buying from someone, very useful tool. I, I, I compare it to if you don't have this, you're flying blind kind of, right? Like you don't know who you're buying from in China unless you're going there and putting a lot of money into it. One of the uh, things I'd like you to take away from my talk today is the level of opportunity that's created by the internet and by connecting people. And going back to that first illustration, right, of the pencil versus that hand tool, the hand axe, and how they never built anything on that hand axe. And we have the ability to connect at levels that like completely unprecedented. And the amount of innovation that's coming, going to come out and already is coming out of that is just phenomenal. Um, I think that the, the import-export space is one area that just has not been disrupted at all compared to what it could be. Like we're doing some disruption and, and shaking things up. But it's a really interesting time to enter that space, especially if, if you come at it with the angle of technology, using the internet, finding new ways to connect people. Look at the innovation that's happened to the travel industry or that's happened to what's happening in publishing and happening in all these other spaces. It's not it's been very slow to affect the import-export industry. But it will happen, right? And you're talking about a trillion dollar industry. Trillions of dollars. There's not many industries like that, but global transport is definitely a trillion dollar industry. And uh, the ability to, to have just a minor impact there, you could A, get very rich, and B, make people's lives a lot easier. Um, focus, on the, focus on B, and you'll get A.